Welcome to the third session of the Junior Professional Legal and Regulatory Tutorial Group. My name is Jess Morton and I work at the Global CCS Institute. My office is based in Melbourne, Australia, although we have people logging in today from all around the world. And we do have some new members uh, who are participating, so I will briefly go over the introduction from from last week uh, and to introduce you uh, to the lecturer as well as our tutors. Um, so apologies if some of you have heard this before. I would encourage you to make the most of the tutorial group by connecting with each other via the internet platform, reading as many of the session materials that you have time for, asking the lecturers and tutors questions throughout this session and having a go at answering the short quiz. Craig will tell you a little more on the quiz at the end of the session. Today's lecturer will be Diana Popatria, uh, who will consider the European Union CCS Directive and the different approaches taken towards the implementation of the directive by the United Kingdom, the Netherlands and Norway. Diana's lecture will go for approximately uh, 60 minutes and, oh sorry, the whole session will go for 60 minutes. Um, Diana will speak for about 30 minutes and then there will be a follow-up discussion. Before we begin, I'll uh, introduce you to Craig and Pam and thank you to everyone for finance, carbon finance and capital markets. He is currently conducting separate studies of for APEC and the Asian Development Bank and this work covers nine developing countries. Pamela Tomsky will co-facilitate the tutorial with Craig. Pam's the Senior Advisor, Policy and Regulatory Americas at the Global CCS Institute. And some of you may have met her before, either as part of her Atlantic Council work or through the Research Experience in Carbon Sequestration Program, which is the premier US CCS education and training experience and career network for young professionals. Pam is the founder and director of REX. Craig and Pam are great facilitators and will be your tutors today. Please take advantage of their wealth of experience by submitting your questions throughout the session. Um, oh, is my audio lost? You're okay now, Jess. I'm okay now. I apologise for that technical uh, technical fail. Um, I'll carry on to introduce you to Diana. Diana has over seven years of experience of providing legal advice on energy and infrastructure projects. In the recent years, Diana has started looking into carbon capture and storage regulations across the European Union. Diana collaborated with the Global CCS Institute on revising the CCS legislation in Romania and on examining the lessons learned in the European Union following the transposition of the EU CCS Directive. Diana graduated from the law school um, in IATI, which is Romania's oldest university, uh, and she holds degrees at Oxford University. That's all from me. Diana, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, and please take over from here. Thank you, Jessica. Um, okay, hello all. So basically, um, I'm going to talk about some um, experience with um, the CCS uh, directive in um, three of um, EU's uh, member states, the UK, the Netherlands and um, Norway. Um, first of all, I'd like to mention that um, this presentation is based um, on um, a report that I've worked on uh, last year for the Global uh, Carbon Capture and Storage Institute. And um, the main purpose um, of um, the report was that of um, looking at the um, practical experience that CCS demo projects across the EU have had with um, the permitting process um, within the context of the um, 
within the context of member states um, transposing the CCS uh, directive uh, into their um, national uh, legislations. Uh, for tonight's uh, presentation, I have uh, chosen uh, the UK, the Netherlands and Norway because um, each of these countries um, has chosen a different transposition method and uh, even more, Norway, uh, for example, hasn't um, transposed so far the CCS, um, the CCS uh, directive. Um, hmm. Okay, so um, for those of you who are um, outside, who are not from the EU, tonight I will uh, cover. I keep referring to tonight because. In Romania right now, where I'm based, it's it's close to midnight. So for some of you, it may be early morning. Um, so I'm going to cover a few a few key points um, about the um, CCS directive, um, as uh, Ian Havercroft uh, covered um, the CCS directive quite extensively in last year's presentation. I'm also going to present a few points on um, the um, transposition process of the CCS directive in each of the selected um, countries. And um, then I'll focus on the three on three key um, points that have been um, identified by uh, our interviewees as barriers and um, try to present a few of the solutions that um, have been found by project proponents and, um, and um, um, relevant authorities. And then I'll leave you with a few of um, our conclusions. So basically, um, regulations in the uh, EU uh, work uh, can work at two at two levels. One level is that um, of regulations developed at um, at EU level, and such is the case of uh, directives, which um, have to be transposed by member states into their own legislation. This means that the directives are not directly applicable to, to EU member states, but rather have to be first transposed into member states' uh, national law, national legislation. And basically, in our specific in our specific case, the CCS directive uh, represents a common denominator for um, CCS regulatory frameworks across um, the EU. Um, the CCS directive sets a number of principles, such as no carbon dioxide should be stored in water columns and um, storage sites with no significant risk of leakage, environmental or health impacts should be selected, but as well as, um, as rules such as the compulsory setup of a financial provision, securing closure and post-closure obligations that need to be complied with uh, by all the member states. And within this framework set by the CCS directive, member states are nevertheless left with um, a certain degree of flexibility um, in terms of uh, regulating uh, certain, um, certain um, aspects such as uh, the instruments for the financial contribution for the transfer, um, for the transfer of uh, responsibility. Um, this this is a direct uh, consequence of the principle of subsidiarity, which which basically the EU is uh, governed by. Um, member states were supposed to transpose the CCS directive by um, June 2011. Um, of course, um, quite 
I mean, few of the member states um, have failed to, to comply with the, this deadline. But in November 2013, the European Commission has requested Austria, Cyprus, Hungary, Ireland, Sweden, Slovenia to adopt the necessary measures to fully transpose the EU CCS directive into their national law. But also has closed and also has closed infringement cases against Belgium, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Germany, Estonia, Greece, Finland, Luxembourg, Latvia, and the United um, and the United uh, Kingdom. Um, a very, uh, I mean, in my view, a very important uh, point um, in the CCS directive is the provision indicating the 2015 review of the um, uh, CCS um, directive. Um, I'll come back to this point in, um, in my conclusions because I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the actions needed for, for addressing the barriers that we will discuss later on is, um, is related to this uh, point in time, 2015, which is indicated by the CCS uh, directive for, the, for, um, the, for, for its review. Um, so that based on the review, there, there may take place um, a revision of the CCS um, directive. So basically, um, EU member states had to uh, had to transpose um, had to transpose the CCS directive into into their um, national legislations. Um, there have been generally there have been uh, or yeah there have been two to um, transposition methods. Um, some countries have chosen a literal transposition and such is the case of uh, and such is the case of uh, the Netherlands, while um, others um, have uh, chosen to um, go into greater to go into greater detail and uh, basically regulate, specifically regulate the aspects left by the CCS directive to member states to, um, to regulate. Such is the case, um, such is the case of the United, um, of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom um, integrated um, the provisions, the requirements of the CCS directive into, um, into its existing um, legislation and basically has engaged into um, developing um, a very comprehensive a pretty comprehensive um, set of uh, regulations um, that's and that's why um, the UK is seen as a leader in uh, developing uh, in developing regulations uh, for um, CCS um, activities. Um, furthermore, um, the UK has proven to be quite innovative in also developing um, funding mechanisms. Nash, at national level for supporting the development of um, CCS um, of CCS projects, and um, basically we have here the national competition for funding uh, CCS projects, but also but also um, the idea of supporting um, CCS uh, projects through the um, Electricity market reform um, through through the electricity market reform, um, whereby electricity generated by uh, plants, uh, part of a CCS chain, would receive um, a higher price. Therefore, injecting cash into the entire uh, CCS um, chain. However, the UK has uh, no CCS uh, project operational yet, and in um, 
February 2014, UK authorities announced that the White Rose and Pierhead projects would share a 100 million um, pound funding and uh, and this um, uh, CCS commercialization um, program. Um, on the other hand, um, Norway is very interesting because um, it already um, operates uh, to full CCS projects at Schleipner and um, Schnovit. Um, and uh, it's petroleum legislation without um, without any specific um, adaptation. Um, for Norway, um, the CCS directive became binding once it um, once the CCS directive uh, was included into the European Economic Area Agreement um, and um, basically the CCS Directive became binding for Norway beginning with the 1st of June 2013. Uh, please bear in mind that Norway is not part of the, of the European um, Union. Uh, Norway is also uh, is also uh, interesting uh, because uh, of its uh, significant potential for uh, transboundary um, CO storage, and um, actually, and actually, uh, the European Parliament uh, mentioned um, in uh, February mentioned in February this year that. Um, for example, a comprehensive, a comprehensive revision of the CCS uh, directive should um, also take um, take into consideration the um, um, high potential for CO two storage in North Sea, and therefore um, carefully address any. Um, any storage liabilities that may um, arise out of um, out of um, Norway's uh, involvement into um, into any transboundary CO two uh, CO two storage. Um, and again, um, and then we also have uh, Netherlands which is uh, very interesting because um, although it has chosen a literal transposition of the CCS um, directive, um, its road project received the, the storage, received the first storage license so in, 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 the, in the EU in, uh, 20, in 2012. So basically, we have the UK with a comprehensive transposition uh, of um, of the CCS directive, but then with no uh, CCS project operational yet. Then we have Norway with two operational projects, but without any dedicated legislation, and we also have the Netherlands with a literal transposition of the CCS directive, but with one project having received um, the storage um, storage license. Um, what's really interesting is that um, basically our interviewees in uh, these three countries pointed out that um, the most controversial points are the financial security, the transfer of responsibility, and um, the financial contribution under the um, financial um, mechanism. Um, so basically, this indicates that irrespective that irrespective of the transposition method these three points um, remain the ones that pose the greatest uh, the greatest um, challenges. 
Um, further on, I'll discuss each of these um, each of these um, each of these barriers in um, in greater um, in greater detail. So basically, Article uh, 19 of uh, the CCS uh, Directive. Uh, requires um, project uh, developers to have in place before injection of a financial a financial um, security um, which should uh, cover all um, all obligations related um, related um, to to the permitted um, storage activities, and uh, basically such financial security should be um, in place before uh, before um, injection. Um, the main um, the main our research indicated that the main uncertainty uh, in relation to the financial security relates to the price of. Um, of uh, emission unit allowances in the long um, in the long run, basically because storage sites can be operated for I don't know 20, 30 years, and then because you have a minimum period of 20 years post closure, it is very difficult. It is very difficult for um, for um, project developers to um, to forecast to model uh, variation in prices of EUAs and therefore it is very difficult for uh, them to quantify to quantify uh, their um, investment um, risks um, a potential solution in this uh, in this respect can be, for example, in I mean, a potential solution to address the uncertainty over the um, uh, EUA's price could be um, that of member states agreeing on a ceiling and floor price per uh, emissions unit um, allowance. However, um, such a shared liability scheme may be interpreted as a deviation from the polluter pays principle um, and may also require the European Commission's approval as it may amount to state aid. Um, basically, under such basically under such a scheme, um, member states would agree um, to to take on to take on the risk of uh, the price per EUA um, um, of for the price of take on the risk of uh, for the price of EUA to experience um, um, exceeding a, cer a certain uh, threshold. But basically this would mean that the polluter won't, the polluter, i.e. the, like the, uh, the CCS project wouldn't be the one covering, um, covering um, uh, its uh, liability, but it would be basically member states using uh, public, uh, using uh, public funds. Also, the entire the entire scheme may also um, um, may also require a lot of uh, administrative um, administrative um, action on behalf of member states, as it may amount to state aid and would therefore require um, require the approval of the um, European Commission, which may be quite lengthy process in the, um, in the absence of a of a um, specifically designed state aid um, scheme already already approved by the um, European um, already approved by the European Commission other issues in relation to the um, other problems in relation to the financial security include um, calculation method 
instruments and um, activities um, and activities uh, covered. Um, just one second. Yeah, so um, in order to make it easier for you to follow, basically I put into this table uh, some country-specific considerations in relation to the financial um, security. For example, in the UK, um, the legislation um, provides for the amount of financial security to be high enough to cover to cover the operator's obligations. Um, it has to be enforced before injection until transfer of liability, adjustable by relevant authorities, um, and uh, there is no regulation of calculation method, terms and conditions, treatment procedure. So, in my view, it's pretty close to the approach taken by the um, um, CCS so directive. Um, the same goes for the Netherlands, which um, has no regulation of calculation method or activities covered. Um, however, um, it's um, interesting that in the case of uh, the road project, basically the project of Poland and the relevant authorities agreed that the financial security should cover the cost of monitoring, contingency monitoring, abandonment, financial contribution, and the cost of e-waste in case of um, leakage. Um, the report, the permitting report released by um, the road project, um, I think mid last year, basically mentions that um, the uncertainty over the cost of e-waste in case of um, leakage uh, remains, an, um, remains an open point. So basically, despite all the support that uh, they have received from Dutch authorities, they still haven't been able to address, um, address um, this point. Um, on the other hand, um, Norway, uh, please bear in mind in the absence of any uh, CCS dedicated legislation, um, basically indicates that the amount in other terms and conditions of a financial security um, sh sh um, is established by the parties on a case-by-case on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, and um, basically um, the amount um, may be determined based on the cost for governments to cover all duties and obligations in the worst, um, in the worst case um, scenario. Norway um, has um, um, in terms of like the instrument, um, in terms of um, like the instrument for financial security, Norway Norway has uh, accepted the parent um, parent uh, guarantees uh, for Schleipnet and Schnorbit. The same should the same goes for road, where um, the financial security um, represent um, represented represents a um, Parent, um, a parent uh, quarantine. Um, the next, uh, the next barrier uh, relates to the transfer of uh, responsibility. Um, basically, um, this is regulated by Article um, 18 of um, of the CCS um, of the CCS uh, directive with the um, two key um, requirements, proof that the CCS is um, permanently, um, permanently contained and basically, um, basically the collapse of, um, of a minimum of uh, 20 years. Uh, the bond, unless, unless the relevant authorities can be convinced before the elapse of 20 years 
that the CO2 is permanently and securely uh, contained. Um, um, in our research and interviews, basically, um, I mean, we found out that basically the bone of contention in relation to this, this article, the CCS Directive, is pretty much the 20, 20 years um, rule. Um, project proponents seem to be seem to be quite unclear as to how as to how the 20 years rule uh, was um, was determined, and most of them felt as if pretty much this was um, a bit of a political a bit of a bit of a, of a political compromise. But precisely because of so because of that. Um, because of this, there are a lot of concerns as to um, the situations when um, um, the transfer of, life, of responsibility would actually be accepted before the lapse of the 20, um, um, of 20 years um, term. And um, yes, another another point which is um, which. Um, is uh, very challenging for investors. It's basically lack of clear criteria for determining whether the transfer of responsibility can operate um, or not. And also, project proponents have um, have uh, expressed concerns about the impartiality of competent authorities. Um, to assess whether the transfer of liability can uh, operate based on the documents uh, produced uh, by um, license um, holders. Um, and again, yes, this is something that um, I should have mentioned when uh, discussing the years rule, is that um, basically this 20 years rule um, has a great impact on um, monitoring, insuring costs, and therefore is very costly for project uh, for project proponents. Um, in terms of uh, country-specific uh, considerations, uh, basically um, the UK um, um, has a wider extent of um, permitted transfer of responsibility, um, i.e. any leakage liabilities, for example, personal injury, damage to property, and economic um, loss. And as of March 2013, it had, like, it lacked any clear criteria for the transfer of responsibility to, to um, operate. Um, on the other hand, the Netherlands lacked a sufficient clarity on the conditions for the decrease in the 20 years rule to operate. Basically, um, uh, for example, the road, um, road, um, the road project um, had to address questions such as which evidence that the, uh, which evidence should be produced that the CO2 stores completely and permanently contained. And of course, will authorities be impartial in assessing um, this evidence? It's very interesting that in Norway, existing legislation does not address this concept, and um, basically um, that the conditions for the transfer of responsibility uh, will have to be determined at the time of uh, climate decommissioning. Um, I should also be mentioning that. Norway uh, was supposed to was supposed to uh, put forward a package of draft legislation uh, for transposing the CCS directive, but um, so far all the information I have been able to identify indicates that the process is still a bit um, a bit delayed. Um, and um, the third third key challenge for project proponents refers to financial contribution under the financial mechanism. 
basically Article 20 of the CCS Directive requires um, um, project owners to, um, uh, to set up a financial contribution to cover the monitoring costs for 30 years and also the costs borne by the competent authority for ensuring that the CO2 is permanently um, contained. Um, basically, um, the challenge um, is that of determining the amount of the financial contribution for the transfer of liability to actually operate. Because otherwise, um, if you can't, like, if, if a cost can't be determined, basically um, the project proponent would continue being liable on and on and on without any liability actually being passed on to the relevant um, authorities. And for example, the road project um, agreed for the financial contribution to cover on the cost of monitoring, while in Norway the financial contribution depends on the specific conditions for each storage site facility. Um, and much and how much your CO2 is uh, stored, thus enabling the calculation of the potential leakage and associated um, costs. Um, again, um, a cross section of the three of um, how with the financial contribution is regulated into three uh, selected countries. Basically, in the UK, the contribution should cover post-transfer costs, i.e. the costs for which the authority will be liable as a result of the transfer of liabilities and obligations to the authority. And um, in the Netherlands, um, precisely because of the difficulty of determining the, the amount of financial uh, contribution, um, the authorities and the project proponents have agreed uh, to uh, for the financial contribution to cover um, and to cover only the monitoring costs. Again, Norway very interesting. Uh, the concept is not regulated by the existing um, legislation criteria and amounts may be determined on a case-by-case -case basis and it's interesting that no financial contribution was asked for Schleipner and um, Schnorfi. Um, in terms of, um, of um, inclusions, I think, I mean, in my view, one of the, um, one of the key lessons learned after having looked these three countries is that regulations do matter, but not as much as the support and the involvement of the relevant public, of the relevant public authorities. Because with the support of the relevant public authorities, solutions can be um, can be worked on. Um, in order to in order to address uh, challenges, basically, basically um, um, the case of Netherlands and Norway demonstrate that there, I mean, no transposition method is better than the other. Actually, in the case of um, of countries having chosen literal transposition. Um, quite a few of our interviewees indicated that um, the literal transposition was a good thing because it allowed sufficient flexibility for um, for um, relevant authorities and um, to consider the specifics of each um, of each um, of each project. Um, what's what's really what's what's really interesting again for me is whether whether there's going to be there's going to be any action 
um, in the EU member states on addressing these challenges uh, before the 2015 review of the um, CCS uh, directive. Um, I think this is going to be pretty much uh, on, I mean, it's going to be seen pretty much on a case by case basis and it depends very much on the agenda of, uh, on the agenda of uh, each country. For example, even in Norway, the um, Montstadt project got, um, got uh, put uh, off for, uh, for now or for good. <laughs> I don't know exactly. Um, I would also think that um, the development of the CCS regulations is a matter of um, the EU gaining, pre gaining practical experience in this respect because it's pretty much a vicious circle without having, without um, actually having uh, more one or more projects fully operational, it's very difficult to understand um, how should um, how should the uh, different aspects of CCS projects be uh, better regulated uh, in order to, of course, uh, make sure that um, um, projects are safe and at the same time address any environmental um, environmental concerns. So. Um, yeah, this would be <laughs> this would be this would be it. I look forward to receiving your questions. Hello, uh, this is Craig Hart. Diana, thank you for that presentation. Uh, we've received about a dozen questions already, um, and I'm going to uh, start off with major legal issues. Um, can you give a little more detail about the legal challenges? And I'm going to give you these in, in, in groups, um, so I'm going to give you more than one question at a time. Um, first question is, uh, can you please discuss the legal challenges associated with transboundary storage? Um, and then the second question is, is, in your view, is too much authority being given to competent authorities, um, given that they can determine at when transfer of liability uh, and responsibility occurs? Uh just one second. So, legal challenges related to transboundary storage, and this one, the second one, was related to the relevant authorities and their um, power to assess evidence. Yes, this is uh, the, the question is on competent authorities whether they're being given too much authority, mm -hmm. too much discretion in determining when transfer of liability and responsibility occur, in your view? Yeah, just a second. Um, you know, I think I'll start, I'll start with, um, with the um, the um, question related to the um, authority granted to the competent uh, to the competent authorities. Um, I think the truth is somewhere. I mean, anyway, in my view, the truth is somewhere halfway. You know, project proponents uh, claim that there's too much there's too much discretion being being left to the to the competent authorities, but on the other hand, um, I would argue that basically there, I mean, the competent authorities should be there and keep an eye, and keep an eye on the evidence being produced by the project 
components um, as to whether the CO2 is permanently and um, safely and safely um, stored. Um, but again, there's also, um, I mean, we go back to the vicious circle that I was just mentioning at the end, at the end of, um, of my presentation. Since the EU has had such a good experience with the CCS project, it's very difficult for it's very difficult to develop uh, basically procedures and um, as to how the transfer should operate, which evidence should be required, and and so on. And um, this makes things very difficult for the competent authorities as well, you know, because you tend to be a bit more relaxed about regulations and how to take things forward when you've had quite quite, quite a bit of experience um, behind you. For example, um, authorities in the UK that we talked to indicated that um, um, for example, with respect to SART, to third-party access, they would be um, thinking, they would be relying on their experience in the oil and gas, um, in the oil and gas um, industry. So, to cut the long story short, I think at this point it's still, it's still very, very early on to say yes. The competent authorities have too much too much your discretion, too much authority, um, because um, it's still a learning process for, uh, for for everybody. And let's not forget that they are under the constant pressure of keeping an eye on the public on the, um, the public interest. Um, in respect of the transboundary uh, transboundary storage, um, I can't say I'm an expert or that I've looked very much in detail in this respect. But um, I've attended the presentation given by, given by an official of the Norwegian uh, government, and um, I've also talked to some um, to people working in. Um, some Norwegian companies involved in CO2 storage, and basically their main concern is related to how to the share of the liability associated uh, to transboundary storage. So, of course, for example, let's just say um, CO2 will be stored um, on, for example, Norwegian territory. Okay, but what will happen? What will happen if there are going to be um, any problems? Will the countries other than Norway that stored CO two there contribute them as well towards addressing any side effect um, of for CO two leakages? And um, I think in my my feeling is that this is pretty much still a debate, a debate going on. But uh, for sure, my feeling is that there is a lot of interest around this and probably um, countries will need to work on a solution, whether in the near or more distant, uh, or more distant uh, future. I was really happy to read that the European Parliament basically uh, indicated that this point needs to be needs to be more carefully um, considered in the CCS direct because I think uh, I think definitely discussing this in greater detail in the CCS directive would somehow you know provide framework provide provide um, a bit of a of a directing line for any interested countries to um, start discussions about on transboundary storage. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I Thank hope you. this answers the question. Yeah, we're, we're going to come back a little bit later to the 2015 review. Um, yeah. Pam? 
Yeah, Diana, thanks so much um, for your great presentation. And our next set of questions focus on stakeholder reception, um, yeah. which is always a pretty hot topic. So yes. stakeholder <laughs> perception, reception, and, and all of the above. So um, you mentioned interviews with stakeholders in your presentation. Um, could you give a little bit more detail about what kinds of stakeholders and how many you interviewed? And then more specifically, if you could comment on industry's perception of the current legal and regulatory framework uh, in the UK and elsewhere in Europe. And how did other stakeholders, the environmental community, the public in general, receive these regulations? Um, so. Yeah, um, so um, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of our interviews were with the project, with project developers. So basically, we looked at CCS project in six EU countries. Um, and, but, you know, because we wanted to have an objective view as much as possible, we also wanted to talk to, um, to, relevant, uh, to relevant authorities. And um, again, I think this is, like, this is a very subjective comment, uh, but my impression was that um, competent authorities uh, especially, especially in the UK, like you could see that they they are trying, they were trying to find the right solutions, um, and they were really getting involved and so on. Um, but at the same time, that it wasn't it wasn't an easy process because of the financial crisis, because of all the other, all the other uh, points that a political agenda may hold, because this is the truth everywhere in the world. Public authorities pretty much um, have also have a political yeah. agenda. Uh, so uh, so they, were tr they were they were struggling. Were like they were trying like to get involved and try to work out solutions. But of course, on the other hand, project opponents felt that um, not enough was uh, not enough was uh, being uh, done. Um, we didn't get to interview, for example, um, too many too many NGOs, or because the idea was that of getting a first-hand impression on you know, uh, the practical experience of project developers, yeah. Okay. Good. I, th I think we're going to focus on the next couple of questions on some country-related um, activities. So, Norway and the UK. Craig, do you want to pick up on that? Yes. Um, Diana, can you, um, can you explain as, as Norway is a member of the EEA as opposed to being a member state. What, what obligations do they exactly have to adopt these regulations? Um, and then given that Norway has used oil and gas regulations for governing its projects up to now, is the, is, is the perception uh, within Norway that these CCS regulations will support or conflict with what they have already been doing? Mm. Uh, this, is a, this is a very interesting question. Um, so basically, Norway, um, as Norway is not uh, is not a member of the European Union, so Norway didn't have the obligation to transpose the CCS directive into its national legislation until um, the CCS directive became part of the European Economic Area Agreement. Um, nevertheless, Norway um, is definitely is definitely interested in sort of transboundary storage of um, of uh, CO2, and um, therefore um, Norway has been 
um, has been seen as very keen on ensuring that at least de facto the the, the provisions of the CCS directive are um, are complied with by uh, by its um, its legislation. Um, Hmm. Hmm. From my discussions with the uh, representatives of Norwegian um, oil and gas companies, um, I had a feeling that they had mixed feelings over the CCS directive. Definitely they were interested in what was happening uh, with the CCS directive, but on the other hand, they felt um, a bit of frustration over all the requirements of the CCS directive, specifically as um, Norway also already has Schleipner and Schnovit fully operational based on the petroleum legislation. So, which means, and as I mentioned in my presentation, basically uh, for those so for those projects, um, the transfer of responsibility and the financial contribution and the financial mechanism um, have not uh, have not been discussed so far, and they were frustrated in a way that okay, we already have the projects operational without having to deal with these with these two key challenges, basically block investments in CCS across the EU. So now with the CCS directive, what what next? But um, yeah, I could definitely feel that um, basically pending the transposition of the CCS directive into Norwegian legislation, there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of discussion as to where where is the Norwegian regulatory framework going to go into? Yeah, Greg? Greg? Uh, yes, uh, okay. Um, Pam, do you want to take the UK questions? Um, I think we'll just um, take, we'll a cup, take a couple, couple short questions couple here for you, Diana, and Diana, then wrap it up. Um, so, to what extent is CCS expected to meet the legal obligations for CO2 emissions reductions in the UK? And to what extent does this current legal and regulatory framework either impede or facilitate further CCS development or deployment? Um, or any other specific observations you have to the UK, just to kind of wrap up on that. Yeah, I think, yeah, um, I, think um, <laughs> I think it's I just think uh, it's I mean the three the three points that I chose to discuss in my presentation were chosen just because I mean all were chosen mainly because they were common to the three countries that I have discussed but also like they were common across um, across the, the EU because I think it's just a matter of how uh, projects were basically in the absence um, in the absence of um, a regulatory framework that would allow for investment for investors to quantify the risks they get themselves exposed to um, projects will not take off and I wouldn't say that this is something like it's particular to, it's specific to CCS, but I would say that generally this is how projects work. If you don't have a clear regulatory framework, then that's that. You can't have projects operational. And uh, I would use here for exa another example, uh, yeah, just to the example of, uh, you know, renewable support schemes across the EU. Um, that got basically, you know, slashed because of the crisis. So look at like investors having made all their projections based on a certain a regulatory framework, but then there came the crisis and everything got, you know, uh, like 
this this board got cut and so in any in any way you are exposed to to a lot of um, to a lot of risks but um <laughs> It's even worse if you can't quantify that from the beginning, such as the case, uh, for example, with the I don't know, with the financial security, with the, um, the um, financial contribution, and so on. Mm -hmm. Ben, good. I I think that covers it um, for today, and and thank you, Diana, for. Uh, covering such an interesting talk and um, many different topics within within that. Uh, Craig, did you have any closing comments or Jess? Uh, no closing comments. Diane, thank you very much for the, the webinar presentation, um, outstanding questions from the audience, and uh, great responses, Diana. Thank you. Um, the, the webinar will be available on the website in recorded form along with presentation slides. Just a reminder that we'll have quiz questions posted on the internet uh, after the session concludes and within a few days we'll have model answers for you to test your own knowledge. Uh, a reminder that session four is the same time next week we will have Andrew Gilder of ENS Africa who will speak on legal and regulatory developments in CCS in South Africa. Thanks again, Diane, and this concludes our webinar for today.